What is up guys and welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm going to be going over the fourth episode in my series called Studying for Dental Hygiene, where I go through every single class that I had while I was in dental hygiene school, showing you little helpful hints, fun facts, and tips and tricks along the way. And in today's episode, we are going to be covering dental materials. I'm totally not even gonna lie dental materials was definitely top three least favorite classes that I had to take I don't know it was just like watching paint dry like this class was not a fan favorite of mine so the first chance that I had to sell the book once I got out of college I was like so I don't have the book as usual I have a binder for this course so I have written that it was a dental hygiene course, the name of the course, and for this class, there was actually two different classes for it. So we had the main lecture course, and then we also had a lab for it as well. So I have a color-coded tab system for every single chapter. I do this with all of my binders. So that way, if I wanna go back and reference something, it is so much easier for me to go back and find exactly what I'm looking for. So a resin composite is the white color fillings, the tooth color fillings that you see. Of course, we always use these in anterior teeth, which are your front teeth, but we definitely have been starting to use them in the back teeth a lot more frequently. This actually is the only thing that any doctor that I've worked for recently even uses. Like we don't even have the amalgam restorations, which are the metallic ones, the silver fillings. This is so much more commonly seen. We had like gold onlays and inlays that they used to do, which onlays and inlays are really not very popular anymore. I very, very rarely see them. Veneers, so you see people who have that Hollywood smile. A PVC or a PFM, these are super, super common. Usually whenever you get a crown, it's a PFM, which is a porcelain fused metal if it's a back crown, or you get a PVC if it's a porcelain veneered crown. So that's like a front tooth where you can't see any metal because obviously it's in the front, you don't wanna see that. Whenever you have a bridge, you have abutments and pontics. So the abutments or what are on the ends of the bridge and the pontics are whatever is in the middle. So the abutments, I always think the butts are at the end and the pontics are in the middle. So it's always APA or APPP, however many pontics there are, the P's are always in the middle because there's actually nothing underneath here. There aren't any roots that are attached. If there was a root surface that was still attached to the tooth, if it was still your natural tooth, it would be an abutment. Removable partial dentures are usually to replace posterior teeth, but people can get them for the anterior teeth as well. A complete denture, so like a full denture, that is made out of acrylic. Most of the time for dentures, they will use acrylic teeth. It's not very common that they will use porcelain. Porcelain is super, super strong. It's very resistant to wear, but it's just like if you were to have a porcelain dish, if you hit it just right, it can become very brittle. Implants are used to replace a missing tooth. So instead of getting a flipper or a partial denture or a bridge, you would get an implant. The implant replaces the root of the extracted tooth. So the tooth that was taken out. There are a couple different ways that they're able to do implants, but the most common is definitely the endosteal where it's placed into the bone. So you can see that right there. That is a screw that goes up there to replace the root of the tooth. And then they just put a crown on the top of it. So that way to a typical person, in. It looks like it is just one of the regular teeth. It fits right in. So there are some restrictions to what materials we can use depending on what are your biting forces, what aesthetic demands do you have, if you have any allergies. FYI, if you have a nickel allergy, you cannot have a porcelain fused tomato crown. So make sure if you have a nickel allergy that we know about it. GV Black is what we used to classify the different types of fillings that you get done. If it's a class one filling all the way to a class C. Six. Class six are very uncommon. So those are all the slides that we have in class. And basically what I would do is I would go through and write down all the main points that we went over in class so that I wouldn't forget anything and I would be able to write it out in a way that was easier for me to visually understand. 
So that was everything for chapter one through four and also chapter seven. So here's some really cool information about the hardness. So enamel, the outer white shell of your tooth, you can see that that hardness is at a 350. But when you look at porcelain, it's at 400 to 500. So porcelain is actually stronger than your enamel, which is why sometimes it is a concern because if this is harder than that and they're occluding together, hitting together whenever you're biting, this can do more damage to your enamel. Now, when you look at the acrylic denture teeth, the fake teeth that they put on dentures. I hear people talk all the time about, oh, it'd be so much easier to just have dentures. Then I wouldn't have to worry about it. It'd be so much cheaper. Look at how different this is. Denture teeth only have about 19% of the natural chewing force that your natural enamel does. Now, another thing is whenever you're brushing. So I see aggressive toothbrushing all the time or people who refuse to use soft toothbrushes. So toothbrushing with a nylon bristle, yes, it's softer than your tooth, but that doesn't mean that it can't wear away the teeth over time because it can. So something else that's really interesting whenever it comes to especially the amalgam fillings, they will actually expand and contract with hot and colds. And even though this is very microscopic, over time it'll actually create a gap between the filling and the tooth. And that's how people get recurrent decay underneath their filling. Because people are always like, well, how do, how do I have a cavity there? It's already filled. Well, that doesn't mean that you can't get a cavity underneath what has been filled before. So that is actually called percolation which obviously will cause tooth sensitivity too if you get stuff underneath there. Okay, so pit and fissure sealants. Now we're talking, now we're getting into something that I personally deal with all of the time. Pit and fissure sealants are a preventative method. So whenever you talk about dental materials, it's a lot of restorative. How can I fix the issue? How can I replace what's been lost? This is basically preventing having to do any of the restorative work. So sealants will be placed on kids ideally when the six molars erupt and also when the 12 year molars erupt but there's even other circumstances where we would recommend sealants as well it just depends on what your caries risk is so what is your chances of getting cavities do you have a high history of it what's your diet like is your salivary flow bad are you not getting any fluoride exposure is your oral hygiene terrible is your anatomy really really deep these are all things that we have to take into consideration whenever we are talking about doing sealants, they are a very non-invasive way to prevent any other drilling in the future. So when we do a sealant, we don't actually have to drill any of the enamel out of the tooth. We have to etch the surface of the tooth just so that it roughens it up so that we're able to get the sealant material to stick to it. But other than that, it is extremely non-invasive. Fun fact, whenever you get your teeth polished, it actually reduces the amount of corrosion that you will see on your fillings. So it helps make them last longer. The advantages of having an amalgam is that they're very tough, they're wear resistant, they last a long time, and they're cheap. They are not as expensive as a resin, the white fillings. They are considered to last 15 to 20 years, but of course your diet and your oral hygiene will play a big role on how long those fillings will actually last. The cleaner you keep them, the longer they're going to last. I tell my patients that all of the time. A mandible denture is a lot less desirable than a maxillary denture because in the maxillary denture, which is the top, you have the palate to suction onto. On the bottom, you don't have that. So it's more likely to float around. It doesn't have any retention. It doesn't have any suction. You're more likely to get sore spots because of that. And it also is going to affect your speech and your chewing ability more. So the difference between a medical implant and a dental implant is that a medical implant is inside of the body. So it's like a heart valve, an organ, a prosthetic joint. An implant is partially inside the body and also partially outside of the body. So some implications that can occur whenever we are doing implants is any systemic diseases that can affect the connective tissue, if you're a smoker, if you have diabetes, especially if it is uncontrolled, that will delay healing. It'll increase your risk for infection and it will increase your likelihood of it actually failing. Also your oral hygiene. So what is your ability to keep it clean? If you keep it clean, you're going to have a good result, but if you don't keep it clean, it's probably not going to last you very long. Here's some fun facts. So why do we polish our teeth? We polish our teeth to reduce adhesion. So we want to make them smoother so that less things are able to stick to it. We want to increase the aesthetics and reduce corrosion. So again, like I said, it makes those fillings last longer. So something that we have to be really careful of is the dentin and the cementum. So the dentin abrades 25 times faster than enamel. 
and its sedimentum is 35 times faster than the enamel. We can also do something called air polishing, which is a combination of air, water, and sodium bicarbonate. This is really, really nice for removing tobacco and chlorhexidine induced stains or also for cleaning around orthodontic brackets. So whitening is not a one size fits all type of thing. It depends on a lot of different factors. What's the cause? What's the degree? The intensity of it? A fun fact for you guys, a crown doesn't need a root canal, but a root canal always needs to have a crown. So if you're going to get a root canal done, Make sure you also get the crown. So it's just talking about the different types of discoloration that can occur. So non-vital teeth will eventually darken over time. And if you ever want to whiten them, they actually have to be internally whitened. Vital teeth are naturally white and bright, but they will darken with age. And these are some different types of stains that we can see. So extrinsic stain is on the surface of the tooth. And these are stains that we can remove. Intrinsic stains are within the tooth. This is something that we can't just naturally whiten. Permanent teeth are naturally darker than primary teeth because of the amount of the enamel and dentin that are present. Here's another helpful tip if you are whitening and you burn your gum tissue. Use vitamin E oil and that will take away the burn. Some side effects of whitening, of course, are sensitivity. So ideally, you want to use a sensitive toothpaste about 10 days to 2 weeks prior to even starting your whitening treatment to prevent that sensitivity from occurring. You want to use it the entire time that you're whitening and for 10 days to 2 weeks after you are done. Some contraindications from whitening. So this is important to note. You cannot whiten a white filling. You cannot whiten a crown. You cannot whiten an implant. Any of that stuff, any restorations will not whiten. The only way to whiten them is to have them redone. So if you see ads for all these different products that can whiten crowns and stuff, that is not real. You cannot whiten a restoration. And when you're done whitening, it's important to make sure that you avoid anything that can stain your teeth for at least one to two days. Professionally applied whitening is about 15 to 35% concentrate of hydrogen peroxide. Patient applied stuff that you can get over the counter is only two to 10%. What you can get professionally is so much stronger than what you typically can get over the counter. Fluoride trays are super effective for people who have a high chance of getting cavities or they have a really dry mouth, they have overdentures, hypersensitivity, or they're undergoing radiation therapy. So if you want to, you could always buy a fluoride gel, put it in your custom tray and self-dose as recommended by your doctor. Night guards are also super important, so people who have bruxism, people who clench. This is really important to help relax the muscles and reduce the amount of wear that is going to be on the teeth. So it's going to be cheaper to buy a night guard than to repair your teeth because of all the damage over time. A space maintainer temporarily is used to keep a space available whenever a baby tooth is lost too early. So even though people are like, oh, it's just a baby tooth, it's not that important. It is important though because baby teeth are also space holders. So say you lose a baby tooth three years before it's ready to come out. By the time that adult tooth is ready to start erupting in, that space that was open for is already going to start to close if you don't have a space maintainer and that increases your chances of having crowding and needing braces in the future. Fun fact, I actually started a small fire in lab in dental materials using one of these. And this talks all about what our instruments are made out of. It's either usually made out of carbon steel or stainless steel. If God forbid it ever breaks off whenever you are scaling, you have to make sure that you find it. Take a radiograph so that you're able to figure out where it's at so you can get that piece of steel out. So the stainless steel alloys, I remembered what they are made out of instrument-wise by remembering nick, so nickel, iron, chromium. You can see all this corrosion I have highlighted in green so that it always stands out to me. Another thing about sealants is that if you are going to place a sealant at the same time you are doing a prophy, you cannot do a fluoride treatment before you do the sealant because that'll affect its ability to adhere to it. And then, of course, I always have my handy dandy note cards that I literally had for every single course that I took. 
So as much as I totally loved dental materials and honestly still love it, it is really important for us to know as dental hygienists because we need to know the science behind the different materials, how to do the infection control, how to handle them, how to store them, and even the different procedures that we are able to personally perform. We still have to know the steps and stuff behind it because patients are going to be asking you about it all of the time. So I hope that that was helpful and informative for you guys. I hope that you learned at least something that you didn't know. If there's anything that you want to personally add to the video, make sure you write it down in the comment section down below. If you did enjoy this video, please let me know by hitting the like button. If you haven't subscribed to my channel, make sure you subscribe to my channel so that you don't miss any of my videos. Like I said, this is part of a series, so I'm making a ton of content related to this subject. This is my career. This is a huge part of my life. And as always, I will see you guys in my next video. Bye guys.